Hello and welcome to the Total Soccer Show Euro 2016 Group A preview. I am Daryl Grove and I'm joined by the yin to my yang, the platini to my tigana, the Zidane to my Vieira. <laughs> it's Taylor Rockwell. Hello. I like all those things. Yeah. Those are all good things. Those are all Euro things. Do you get the theme? Euro things. <laughs> well, also, like, you're the creative French one. French things. And I'm the hardworking one. <laughs> okay. In, in great French teams of the past. Yes. Yeah, I'll take that. So today we're here you to... You do preview. the legwork and I think of the fun thoughts. Pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. Today we are, we've both done the legwork. We've done our research. We are here to preview Euro 2016 Group A, which is France, Romania, Switzerland, Albania. You got it. Um, we have very specific predictions and, you know, a few little fun facts mm-hmm. about each and every team. Yep. So before we begin, though, maybe a little chat about the Euros in general. Sure. Um, France hosting. Yep. The thing that struck me after doing all our Copa preview is I'd forgotten that third place in a group mm-hmm. at Euro 2016 might be good enough. Yeah. Right? So four of the six um, third place teams will go through to the next round. The thing that I had forgotten is that in qualifying that if you finish second, you automatically qualified for the uh-huh. Euros, which I completely forgot. So I kept trying to find three of the, or two or three of these teams, three, I think three of them, all three finished second, I think, trying to figure out, like, well, who do they play in the playoffs? And I was like, oh, right. <laughs> Nobody. Yeah, so all three, and then France, obviously, qualified without having to go into a playoff. So there are 24 teams, mm-hmm. Euro 2016, and to me, this weirdly makes the groups more exciting. Absolutely. Because it means, like, everyone will look at this group and say, yeah, France and Switzerland, mm-hmm. they have the most famous players, yep. therefore I think they'll finish one and two which is how a lot of people do their previews, right? Yep. But the interesting thing now is Albania and Romania, you may, in past you might have just uh, dismissed them. This time, there's a decent chance either of those teams can take third place right. and, you, and qualify. It basically takes like one win here or one win and a draw. Mm-hmm. Well, that would probably get you fourth. So yeah, I mean, really, it leaves <laughs> a lot to play for. And then obviously with the expanded tournament, all the groups look a little like like a greater chasm maybe in talent, but I don't think that chasm is quite as deep as maybe it looks on paper. As you mentioned, I think a lot of times it comes down to like, oh, I know that name and I know that name and I don't know any of those names. But the more we research, Mm -hmm. the more exciting it gets. Exactly. This is definitely true. Should we start with the host nation, France? I don't see why not. Okay, so France, World Cup 2014, quarter-finalists, lost to eventual winners, Germany. Mm -hmm. Can you forget how good that French team was at World Cup 2014? Mm -hmm. Those young guys are two years older. This team is two years better. Yes. They are stacked with talent, but they also have some important players missing. Well, from what I see, they will likely start Alphonse Areola, Matthew Debussy, Mamadou Sako, Raphael Varane, Jeremy Matthew, Morgan Schneiderlin, Adrian Rabio, Matthew Valbuena, Hatem Ben Arfa, Kevin Gamero, and Karim Benzema. Did you just name the, uh, the, f- the missing French 11? <laughs> More or less, <laughs> yes. Could probably uh, also <laughs> compete in this tournament. Yes, I, I sure did. So the, the big thing to me is uh, Benzema um, yep. excluded because he's accused of blackmailing teammate Matthew Valbuena. He's, he's in, he is accused of being involved in the plot and having a conversation with Matthew Valbuena about maybe you should just pay them. It's, yes. Yeah, it's what I said. Yes. You're just covering our bases, I think. <laughs> I don't know what and you're then, talking about. Yeah. And then there's that list of centre-backs, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Raphael Varane would yes. essentially have started. Mm-hmm. I think Jeremy Matthew w- would have had a chance. Um uh, Laporte, I th- I'm not sure if he's even played yet, but he's this like, up-and-coming mm-hmm. uh, Athletic Brazil Bilbao centre-back. And then the weird one is Mamadou Sako. Can we talk about why he's not there? So he initially... The Liverpool centre-back, in case. Yes, so know. he initially was said to have failed a drugs test, right, during mm-hmm. uh, Liverpool's Europa League uh, knockout round games, uh-huh. right? And then he, basically this week, this past week, they turned out... It turned out no. You hadn't. Yeah. There was a, what, we were wrong. Error? Yeah, basically. Yeah. And so now there's some reports that he's going to consider legal action because obviously he was dropped because it seemed like he was going to be banned for two years. Yep. Um, and so he was dropped from contention, so now obviously he can't be called back in. But it did look like he maybe had that other starting spot before all of this drama occurred. Yeah, but so, Coach Didier Deschamps mm-hmm. says, I understand that he's now available, but yeah. it wouldn't be fair to the players I've selected if I bumped someone mm-hmm. to bring Sako back in. So France will be down to sort of their... I think Laurent Kashani was maybe mm-hmm. a first-choice centre-back, yeah. but his partner's going to be fifth or sixth down the order, I yes, think. Yes, that's true. We, we think it's going to be Adil Rami who played it, for Sevilla in the Europa League final. It's either going to be Adel Rami. Ironically against uh, Liverpool. Yeah. <laughs> it's either going to be Adel Rami or uh, Elikayam Mangala from Manchester City. Okay. But it seems, I, I have it as Rami. I think you do as well. Just because performances for Sevilla combined with recent performances for France, yeah. I have not seen Mangala in there very much. The one, other one I wanted to point out in terms of players that are missing, we mentioned Valbuena, we mentioned the situation with Karim Benzema. 
just to clarify, that is not why he is not included here. It's not like he's involved in that scandal, and so he's been excluded as a result. It's basically Who? just very poor form, Valbuena. Oh, it was okay. injuries this season. He wasn't able to kind of lock down a sustained starting role, get a lot of games in, and so I think he's kind of at a low ebb in terms of his overall readiness for this tournament. Yep. That's why he isn't in this team. Should we move on to our very specific predictions for France? I think we have three each because they're the big dogs in this group. They're the tournament hosts. Sure. Would you like to go first? Sure. I have erred on the attacking side because okay. there are going to be goals for this team. But I think there are going to be goals at both ends. It's worth mentioning. In their last five games, they've scored 12 goals. That's good. They have eight goals against. So they've got a lot of problems that need fixing. But I think they're going to be trying to score a lot of goals in this, uh, in this group stage. So I'm going to start with... Uh, I'll go with from the ain't, if it ain't broke, uh, don't fix it department. Dimitri Payet with a goal or assist from a set piece. Dimitri Payet, yes. who most people would not have thought was mm-hmm. going to be starting for this French team. How has he played his way into the team then, and why do you think he's getting a goal and an assist? First off, with what he's done with West Ham in the Premier League this season, where he's been such an exciting, electrifying player. He's been that free kick specialist for the team. He's been the player that can get that assist, that can get that goal late in the game, and I think it's to Deschamps' credit that he's brought in players like Pyatt, players like N'Golo Kante, who maybe were unheralded, but had mm-hmm. very strong Premier League campaigns. Yeah. And I know people would be Non-Champions like, Non-Champions yeah, League players, essentially. Yeah, yeah. but I, and I also think people would be like, yeah, of course, you bring in Kante. He was, you know, player's player of the season, and or he was, he was in there in contention for Leicester. But you look at other teams, for example, Germany, they've called him Bastian Schweinsteiger. Like, I think a lot of coaches tend to call in the players they Tried know. Tried and trusted. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, I'm not being critical of that, but so I think it is a sign of how good Payet has been, that he's been brought into consideration for Deschamps. But where does he fit into this team? That's the interesting mm-hmm. thing for me. Like, uh, for West Ham, he's more like, you know, the go-to creative hub kind of guy. Right. For France, he's not that same central figure. Mm-hmm. So where does he fit into France's formation? On the wing. Because we expect France to play that 4-3-3. I think he'll be on the left side of that front three. That's okay. where we've seen him play a few times for France so far. That's where he's been scoring goals for France. It's so Payet far. versus Anthony Martial essentially, right, for that yeah. left-sided attacking spot. They are loaded with talent up front. They very much are. I would say the reason why I made this prediction, though, is because even if Pyatt comes in late, as he did against, I believe, Russia, uh-huh. still is probably going to be the set-piece taker. He scored a beautiful, like, 35 yards out or so, a beautiful free kick against Russia. He then has a great free kick against Cameroon as Recently, well. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. So I think he is going to be that set-piece provider, and that could be either with an assist or with a goal. Either way, I see Pyatt getting some sort of credit for one of those two things. My prediction is about the main man for France, mm-hmm. as I see it. It's Paul Pogba. Paul Pogba of Juventus will finish this tournament by being the most expensive player in the world. Really? Yeah. Now, how do you register that? Well, uh, Gareth Bale was 100 million euros, I believe, when Real Madrid brought him. Uh, bought him. Uh, it seems that Pogba may be on the move from Juventus. Mm-hmm. I think he will have such a dominant tournament that either Real Madrid come in with an even bigger offer um, or Manchester United try and get him back. I know there's mm-hmm. been talk about that. Yep. Or Barcelona come and take a look. I think there'll be some sort of bidding war so that by like late July, we see Paul Pogba on the move for over 100 million euros. Gotcha. So it's not just that he will, like his approximate value will be the most expensive player in the no, world. It will be, be that there will be a transfer... That will make him the most expensive player. A fax machine will send some paperwork <laughs> with some very big numbers on it. And it's because he's, I think he catches the, I mean, he's so effective, but he catches the eye mm-hmm. so much because he's dominant physically. Mm-hmm. You've seen him just like literally step across people and take the ball off them yep. as if they were children, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> he's dominant mentally. I feel like he's really like, is really smart about like what to do in a game and how to, how to influence it. Mm-hmm. And then just technique wise, he has flashy moments, like crazy turns, crazy tricks. And you saw the, um, that game against Cameroon. I assume we saw the same highlights. That cross he puts in for Olivier Giroud's goal is that I think I just I saw it described as filthy on yep. Twitter. It's essentially from deep. There's no danger, and yet he's able to bend a ball in and pick out Giroud from an angle that shouldn't. It really shouldn't be possible to do it. In so if notes, Paul Pogba sent, spends this tournament yep. doing things like that, with, he's going to break all kinds of. Uh, well, he's going to break the big record for most expensive player in the world. You will get no disagreement from me here because in my, mo- my in my notes that was listed as a ridiculous cross. Yeah, because I have Paul Pogba will make the Sports Center top ten at least once in this tournament. <laughs> For plays like that. Yeah. And it's for all the things that you mentioned. But it's in, like Steph Curry type stuff. Yeah. It's like how what? How what? That's the, that the, kind that's of thing. the element. It's like <laughs> even that cross, it's sort of it's not just that it's this pinpoint cross over the top of two defenders. It's that it sort of comes out of nowhere. Yeah. Like he just kind of pops out of his foot, but uh-huh. it's this 
inch perfect ball and we and then he has those little moments of skill you talked about especially playing for Juventus where it's like wait what did he do mm-hmm. because it looks totally normal like oh yeah he just kicked it up in the air and you watch it again it's like oh no he rainbowed it but then he rainbowed it like off of his other foot like it's <laughs> it's just he pulls off weird moments of skill and, and then expect- there were just and then there were just those physically dominant yeah. moments yeah. where he just steps across and relieves people of the ball yeah like, that's mine that's not yours that seems less likely to make the top 10 unless he like crushes somebody into, <laughs> into like an advertisement uh, but I, I think he definitely makes the top 10 at least once especially because it's Paul Pogba it's a fun name to say and he's got like <laughs> the interesting hairstyle it seems like all of the things that an ESPN producer would want in that top yeah he, he has all the tools to be a star like the yeah. things that make you a good soccer player and then mm-hmm. the extraneous things that people notice absolutely places like Sports Center. Mm-hmm. anyway so that's all, my all respect to the good people at Sports Center. so we each have a prediction about uh-huh. Paul Pogba I've got one about Dimitri Payet what's your next one for France it's Olivier Giroud mm-hmm. um, okay it's sort of a sitting on the fence prediction but it's one of those things where it just could go either way Olivier Giroud will either have a dream or a nightmare <laughs> Euro 2016. Mm-hmm. And I base this on the idea that Olivier Giroud, the striker, is... And I like him. I like his game. Not Olivier Giroud, the electrician? No. Okay. <laughs> he's kind of streaky, right? Yep. He's either confident, and then once he's confident, he's banging in volleys, headers. He's doing incredible hold-up play with back-to-goal chest and flicking things on for other mm-hmm. people. Or Olivier Giroud is constantly missing chances. Yep. Um, and I think it goes one way or the other for him. It's all going to depend on how his first game goes yep. I don't know if you know this but the uh, before the game against Cameroon which was their most recent their warm up friendly mm-hmm. Giroud was booed oh, yeah. by French fans essentially for his not great form mm-hmm. and because he's not Karim Benzema yeah which is tough like I saw him say like I don't know why the fans are doing that I wish they would just get behind us yeah and it's just such a sad statement right that like kind of shows you who he is because it's not like the Ronaldo he seems like a nice guy right? yeah that's the thing it's like it's not the Ronaldo like the fans can say what they want I know who I am like yeah. it's not a defiantly I am who I am uh-huh. sort of statements Latin would do the same thing it's more of like oh come on, guys let's yeah. be friends like he seems like he wants people to like him and it affects him when they don't so he could be a legend by the end of this tournament mm-hmm. like host nation top scorer yeah. centre forward for a Euro 2016 winning oh, team oh man or he could be Fred ooh yeah nobody wants that <laughs> nobody not even Fred wants, wants that so and just, so, just to uh, put this in perspective mm-hmm. France has that front three we talked about they have the option of Giroud Griezmann Payet, Martial, Kingsley Coman, and Gignac. Mm-hmm. So I think Gignac's maybe on the outs, but it's at least five big names, mm-hmm. five big names that could form a front three. Well, so, that- so what I'm saying is, sorry, that Giroud could easily mm-hmm. lose his place with a bad game and a half, and then maybe he never comes back. Yeah, that could happen. We shall see. But in the meantime, we shall see, I think, Kingsley Coman as an impact substitute. So I have that Kingsley Coman will score after the 70th minute in at least one group stage game. Okay. Because if you look at what he's been doing for France, he's been scoring or playing very electric soccer, scoring some very impressive goals that come, kind of, again, come out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. But if you look at the opponents in this group, it's going to be, I think, a very defensive group when it comes to playing against yeah. France. Not so much Switzerland, but definitely Romania and Albania. And even right? Switzerland, maybe against France, for I that could game see only. them sitting back a little yeah. bit more than they would against the other uh, teams in this group. Fair. And so I could see them needing that kind of electrifying, exciting, speedy player to come in in the 70th or 75th minute and try to create something and try to make something happen. Or I could see him brought in to kind of mop things up when they're already 3-0 up and get one more goal. So for those reasons, I'm going to say he's going to get a goal uh, after the 70th minute as a substitute. That's not mop things up. That's dirty up the floor even more. Yeah, true. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> True. Any more for France for you? My final one is mm-hmm. all about the man who is sometimes overlooked because of Paul Pogba. Mm-hmm. It's Blaise Matuidi. Mm-hmm. Uh, Blaise Matuidi, the PSG midfielder. He was the guy who, every time PSG spent big money on a player, people thought, well, this guy's like, you know, from here, he's probably the guy that's going to step aside. Every time Blaise Matuidi ups his game, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So we talk about the, um, the way that France set up. We say it's a defensive midfielder. It's either Lastiara or Angolo Kante. I think the fairy tussle would be Conte holding. Yeah, it definitely in. would be. But last year I does the same job in terms of tackles and interceptions. And seems to be Deschamps' preferred player. Yeah, I think so, because well, he's been around longer mm-hmm. as well in the French national team. And essentially it's Pogba to the right, I believe, and Blaise Matuidi to the left. I can't remember if it's maybe the other way around. So they patrol each of those flanks each, and you watch Matuidi just bomb up and down, bust in his lungs. Mm-hmm. So I, my prediction is that Blaise Matuidi will have at least one full-length run of the field. Like You will see him go from one end to the other. Either direction. Yeah. You either go from back to front or front to back. I like that. So like Blaise Matuidi, full-length sprint of the field. <laughs> um, 
we, I've done my three. This is just kind of like a random musing. But I also wanted to say <laughs> that the the players that will most likely start outside back are uh, Bakary Sanya and Patrice Evra. Yeah. And I want to say the those, ageless Patrice Evra. Those two will cause the most bipolar uh, Europe like previews of any players in this tournament. Why? Because I've seen it written so many times. It's either expected to start Sanya and Evra out wide to very like veteran players who know their role and who can lead this team and be like strong figures, or it's older guys who are maybe past it, can't <laughs> run anymore, might be a weakness. Like it's just that weird. Like well, which one is it? How can you be a good leader who knows your role? but also be too old and you can't keep up. The truth is neither, right? Exactly. The truth is somewhere in between. Exactly. Yeah. And that's why I say it's just sort of like, it's a coin flip, I guess, in terms of which <laughs> narrative you want to go with. Or you could just say, yeah, they're probably pretty good. We'll see what happens. So, yeah, that's France, your mm-hmm. host. Their first opponent is Romania in the opening game on June 10th. Yep, so let's yep, talk yep. about Romania. Let's talk um, about Romania. Quick word about their coach. Their coach is Angel Jordanescu in his third spell as Romania coach. This is the same man who coached that famous Georgie Haji Romania team in 1994. The Bleach Blondes. The Bleach, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if that was his idea or the players' idea. I believe it was the players' but idea. But he is out of retirement to take over this team. The stat you will hear everywhere mm-hmm. about Romania is that they only conceded two goals mm-hmm. during the qualification process, and that is essentially how they got themselves to Euro 2016, right? right? It's on the back of some staunch defending. They play a sort of... You could call it a 4-2-3-1 or you could call it a 4-5-1, but it's going to be defensive. Yep. So don't expect too many goals, but expect them to be tough to break down, especially in that opening game. A couple more points to, uh, to back up what Daryl Grove has just said. In qualifying, they had a 428-minute goalless drought. Mm-hmm. Not ideal. They had, basically, as their top scorers, they had three different players score two goals. Two of those players... Uh, Constantine Budescu and Paul Pop did not make this squad. <laughs> so four of the six goals from qualifying, not involved anymore. So yeah, they had the best defensive record, but they didn't score too many goals either, and I do think that will probably continue on in this tournament. So do you have any uh, predictions? I mean, I know you do, otherwise you've uh, failed in your research. Yes, <laughs> What's I do. your first prediction? Well, I want to go with something optimistic, because I do think it's going to be a more defensive team. So I'm going to go with Nikolai Stansiu will score from distance, and that can be either a free kick, I've seen or it can happen. just be a screamer. You watched the <laughs> same highlight video as yeah. I did, did you? Yeah, so uh, Nikolai, I'm going to go with that since I'm probably mispronouncing his last name, is a 23-year-old attacking midfielder winger for Stal Bucharest. He is a free kick specialist. I'm sure you saw the one where he took the free kick from like a tight angle and he put it in at the near post mm-hmm. and it was beautiful. Um, he can also hit from deep. Again, same highlight reels. I saw that. And I do think that against, for example, Albania, they're going to be very compact. I do think in this case it will be Romania, maybe taking the game to them a little bit more. And I think when you have a compact team, sort of what my prediction was uh, in the Champions League, which didn't come, I think it's going to happen here. It's that it's going to rely on then long shots to try to open that defense up a little bit and I think that's going to be young Nikolai taking those shots I also have a statue uh, prediction what you got which is so he's more than just long shots right mm-hmm. he creates space for those long yep. shots with his he's a little number 10 essentially mm-hmm. he's got the low center of gravity great balance great acceleration nice turn um I think he's the most exciting player on this team he's all the excitement that the rest of this team isn't I think he won't start against France mm-hmm. in the first game because I think Jordanescu will be very conservative and go with more defensive midfielders mm-hmm. and not the likes of Stanchu. So my kind of little prediction is that Romanian fans will be calling for Stanchu's inclusion because they'll see mm-hmm. the sort of dour stuff on the international stage against France and they will want Stanchu in this team. Well, I, the, the confusing thing with that is that like, I think you might might be confusing Romanian fans with neutrals. Because if Romania go out and play very dire soccer but get a nil-nil draw, as you said, third place gets you to the knockout round. What if they get a one-nil loss? Well, that changes things. <laughs> but if you go and get a nil-nil draw, then maybe they don't care, but maybe the neutrals yeah, are like, that's well, true. that wasn't fun. That's true. I don't want to watch them again. Put in that exciting guy. Let's see what happens. Well, in the same vein, uh-huh. here's my first actual prediction. Mm-hmm. There will be no more military titles awarded to coach Jordanescu. Explain. So he's known as the general Mm -hmm. because he played for Stau Bucharest, which is the army team, um, as we know from uh, former communist countries. Um, He was promoted to colonel for his service to Stau Bucharest. After the 94 World Cup, when he, that fancy Romanian team that had all the amazing moments with Georgi Haji et al, um, he was promoted to major general. In December 2015, in recognition of his getting Romania to Euro 2016, he was promoted to three-star lieutenant general. Good. Was it lieutenant general? Was that just the British way? Lieutenant general. Lieutenant general. Um, but I think that the defensive kind of uninspiring soccer that we'll see at Euro 2016 
even if they get out of the group, will not be enough for any more stars. He's no done. more military promotions. No field marshal for him. No field marshal. <laughs> Unless they, like, grease it all the way and win it. You know that if we were actually doing this for points, there is absolutely no way I'm letting that one slide, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> I got, I, okay, well, then I'm going to say that he also won't be an astronaut. Is that also allowed? Well, this is, but he's never been an astronaut. He has been promoted many times through the military ranks. That's, somebody in the Romanian military has to be furious about that, right? <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> like, there's a person who's been there for, like, 25, 30 years, has served all over the place, moved around, been a part of, like, UN attachments, and, <laughs> and then it's just like, really? That guy ranks above me? Or you see, he gets a military pension? This is ridiculous. Well, the other thing that gets me is, what if Romania go to war? Like, do they then, does Yudinescu then suddenly have to serve, and he is a three-star lieutenant general, and he's in charge of, like, organizing troops, and he's telling the troops, okay, we're going to go out in a 4-5-1, and we're going to counterattack, and the troops are like, what? That's not what we do. <laughs> hey. It could be innovative. <laughs> you don't know how these things work. Should we get us back on track with your next prediction? Tyler? Sure. My, my next prediction uh, goes to the defense. Yeah. I think that's where Romania will be going. Mm-hmm. It is that Vlad Karikish, which I believe is how you pronounce that name, will have a sliding poke tackle with his right foot. <laughs> <laughs> Getting real specific here. Um, so he is going to be the captain for Romania, it seems. He's going to be tasked with shepherding a very solid back line, a well-organized defense, if you will. <laughs> um, I think with the pace of France and I think with the uh, the skill of Switzerland as well, there's going to be a little bit of scrambling, though, with this defense. And if you watch the clips of Vlad playing defense, it's a lot of those tackles that we love where it's sort of sliding and then he pokes it away. Yeah. Like, it's not taking the player out. It's a very, like, calculated, I'm sliding along with you and then putting the ball away. Yeah. But one thing I noticed... Mil- military precision. There you go. One thing I noticed is that it doesn't matter what side of you he's on, it's coming with his right foot. Right. So it could be swinging around you and then taking taking the ball and maybe taking your legs too. Uh-huh. Or it could be from the, the left side and that's when he's sliding in and poking it away with the outside of his right boot. I think we've been watching the same stuff. I had mm-hmm. a similar prediction about really? Vlad. It's the... Um, Spurs fans won't mm-hmm. recognize him. Yeah. So then the knock against Vlad when he played for Spurs, mm-hmm. he now plays for um, Napoli, I believe. Yep. Um, is that he used but to. Plays for is a fair term, but yeah. He's sure. now contracted to yes. Napoli. Mm-hmm. Um, when he played for Spurs, he got a reputation for risk taking, and the risk taking did not come off. Right. Right. We talk a lot about centre backs on this show where sometimes it's like high risk, high reward. Like Sergio Ramos is this kind of player mm-hmm. where you put yourself out there and try and win the ball. And it seems like. He's matured into a yep. place with Romania where he takes his risks and instead of it being a disaster, he wins the ball. Yep. And the slide tackle, poke tackle that you talked about mm-hmm. is exactly the kind of thing. At Spurs, that would have probably taken someone down and given away a penalty. Yeah. For Romania, he wins the ball and he's a hero. Yep. So I think Spurs fans will be like, what, him? Really? Mm-hmm. What happened? Yeah, it, and yeah that's, that's a good shot because it is just such like so many of the tackles I saw were just these like very clean, very precise, just like, oh, and that's dealt with. I think like, it's about confidence. Mm-hmm. If you know your place is secure and yeah. you're just comfortable in the team, then it's much easier to make those risky decisions yeah. and get, get it correct. That's a good point. You know what I'm saying? There we are. All right. All right. Any, any more predictions or is it back to me? That's back to you. All right. Um, I believe that Mihai Pintili, the defensive mm-hmm. midfielder, will end the tournament as some sort of villain. Oh, boy. Here's why. Does so, he have uh, like an eye patch and a scar? <laughs> not, not yet. No? Um, Pintili is a sort of little muscly, aggressive, defensive midfielder. He's getting in people's faces a lot. So there may be one sort of horror tackle or just something a bit bad. But he's also the guy that um, he, he briefly played in uh, Saudi Arabia. And there was a, a moment when Asimo Gian, remember Asimo, Asimo mm-hmm. Gian, the Ghanaian forward, was sent off. And apparently... You know that I root for the US men's national team, yes? Yeah. I am fully aware <laughs> of who Asimo Gian is, Yes. In the sort of ruckus afterwards, mm-hmm. apparently Pintili racially abused Asamo Jian. Not ideal. According to Jian. Yeah. So basically this guy is, it seems, kind of a nasty piece of work yeah. in that way that sometimes a team needs. It's that nastiness that Klinsmann was talking about with maybe going over the line into racism. So one way or another, he's going to become a villain. And from my notes, it seems like he will probably, if they do do the 4 2 three, one, he will be one of those two yeah. holding defensive midfielders. Mm-hmm. Literally not, holding. He will be holding very, yeah, He's going to be defensive. So, again, I think sim- similar with Karikesh, I think you're going to see those tackles, that physicality, a little bit of shouldering off the ball, and maybe a little bit of that like lingering to have a few words after the ball is gone. Mm-hmm. I could see that. That's a good <laughs> shot, too. Thus far, Daryl, I appreciate most of your predictions. Do you have anything else for Romania? I do not. Um, I just want one quick note is just about um, the way they'll line up going mm-hmm. forward. Because yeah. we talked about them defensively. They will have forwards or forward, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, from what I understand, it's uh, Claudia Kessaru mm-hmm. will be the lone striker. 
the debate is about sort of who plays underneath him, right? You seem to think it may be Stanchu. Yeah. Um, it could also be uh, the old man himself, uh, Lucian uh, San Martin. Mm-hmm. Currently playing for Al Ittihad yes. in Saudi Arabia. So how old is he? Like 35, 36? Yes. Wasn't it? So this is the guy who, from what I've read, and I really hadn't heard much about him before, was supposed to be the new Haji, mm-hmm. but turned out to be the new Freddie Adu, Joe Cole type, like kind of still professional, but not the guy you were supposed to be. I would venture to guess that with any country that has that one iconic player, there are many, oh, he's the next blank yeah. players in that team's history. I think, uh, yes, I think San Martin might be one of those as well. <laughs> I don't think he's going to be the one to start behind, though. I do think it will end up being Stansu. I do think it would be Casero ahead of him, and then it will be, this is confusing, Torja on one side and Stanku on the other. Oh, there's the other that, yeah. As I texted you last night, in right... Bob Dance, thank you. In do, thank you. In doing my predictions at uh, 2 a.m., trying to figure out, like, wait, did they get this wrong? Is there a typo? Why did they say Stanku and Stanchu scored? And that's the answer. It's because there are two different players. And then one weird thing to keep an eye on is um, Alexandru Maxim, mm-hmm. who plays for Stuttgart in the Bundesliga. Sure. Sort of like the most, or one of the most high-profile um, mm-hmm. players left off the roster, which is a little worrying for... Uh, for Romania yeah. in terms of their attacking intent. Maybe. But, again, I think that's one of those where maybe if you have more familiarity with the situation, it starts to make a little more sense. Maybe there's, there's attitude problems. Maybe there's not fitting the coach's system. Hey, if you're a military general or have aspirations <laughs> to be, you only want to employ the people who are going to listen to your commands and execute them perfectly. <laughs> Next up, it is Albania. Mm-hmm. So Albania are making their national tournament debut, right? They've never qualified for a tournament before. And it seems to be thanks to the work of Italian coach Gianni De Biassi. Mm-hmm. Um, I like this guy. So he took over Albania in 2011. Mm-hmm. And I think of this Albanian team as a project he's been working on. Yeah. And he's been tinkering and tinkering and tinkering. And now he has a team that has made it all the way to the tournament. You, my favorite thing about him, I don't know if you know this already, um, he became an Albanian citizen in 2015 as um, a symbol of the bond between him and his players because so many of his players are sort of diaspora, like mm-hmm. guys, some of them from Kosovo, right. who have like moved moved abroad mm-hmm. but have chosen to represent Albania. Kosovo used to be part of right. Albania. So just as a bond with his players, mm-hmm. he took Albanian citizenship in 2015. Now, when you say tinkering, do you mean putting more bricks into a wall? <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you're talking about? Kind of. <laughs> right, because Albania, similar to Romania, I, I don't expect them to break any sort of scoring records Mm-mm. in this tournament. Uh, they just had a weird record in qualifying, which was that they had uh, six joint top scorers. Yes, because they had no one score more than one goal. Correct. Uh-huh. Including own goal was one of their top scorers. And another one that took me a very long time when looking at their stats is they had 10 goals for. And I was very confused as to how that yeah. could be the case when you only had six goal scorers. One own goal, one three nil forfeit from Serbia. So again, it looks a little bit more like they got like, oh, they got a three nil result at Serbia. Yeah, no, they didn't. So we're going to talk about this. Mm-hmm. This result against Serbia yeah. is probably the main reason that they qualify, right? Right, because that is a huge result. You wouldn't expect Albania to go to Serbia and win, especially not three nil. Mm-hmm. And if they lose, they finish this this group uh, two points ahead of Denmark. So then if they don't get those three points, Denmark goes to this tournament. Right. So what happened was, you, you okay to go over this? Yeah. Um, so what happened was there was a sort of Albanian fan mm-hmm. who th- flew a drone mm-hmm. over the stadium. It was already kind of a really tense atmosphere, yep. people being booed, um, with a map of Greater Albania, yep. which includes Kosovo and some other, like some Serbian territory as well. Mm-hmm. Really angered the Serbian fans. It pushed them right over the edge. There was a pitch invasion. There was a fight. Players were attacked. There were, there the, were plastic chairs thrown from the yeah, stands. Yeah, it was like a wrestling match yep. um, so more like Ted DiBiase than Gianni <laughs> DiBiase um, so the match was abandoned I think it was originally awarded as a 1-0 win to Serbia mm-hmm. and was later changed to a 3-0 win to Albania and that's that's how they're there yes. which isn't to say that they don't deserve to be there because it's still a magnificent sort of heroic performance mm-hmm. to get all the way there on the plus side every football writer slash journalist who's written a book about when soccer and society cross cross paths, uh-huh. it was like, yes, I get to add a new addendum to my book. And they can write a whole new <laughs> chapter about that game. So at least there's that. And so talking tactically, um, Johnny DBRC plays, you could call it a 4-2-3-1, but four, again, five, one. it's it basically a 4-5-1. It's a 4-5-1, isn't <laughs> it's it? It's absolutely a 4-5-1. So Albania one. play kind of defensively. Mm-hmm. All right, Tyler, any um, specific predictions yes. for Albania? I have that if, Al- if Albania scores... 
Sokol, if, yeah. Come on. Sokol uh, Sikaleshi will be involved. So that's either getting a goal or an assist. Mm-hmm. And here is why. Because I do not think that uh, Sikaleshi will start, at least not the first game. I think it will be more likely be uh, Beckham Balaj. He tends to start a striker. But he has zero goals in the last five games and only one goal, as we said, in the Euro qualifiers. Do so you think they'll, they'll see what they can do with him and then switch it out to Sikaleshi and then I Sikaleshi do. scores? Because Sikaleshi has scored... Uh, He's basically scored in two or had an assist in three of the last four games. So he's definitely getting on the score sheet. He is creating opportunities for Albania, for his club. And this is the main reason why I think this. And for Istanbul BB, I'm not going to do the whole BB. Is that like the... It's like Büyükşehir Bilia Desi. Oh, I thought yeah. it was like um, a, a B team, B team. No, no. <laughs> no, they're, they're in the, the Superliga. It's like Orlando BB. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. So he uh, plays alternately as a forward or a midfielder. In the league last season, he had 27 appearances and six goals. But when you look at that, it's actually only at eight starts. So he's gotten six goals from eight starts. That's Which not league bad. is this? In the Turkish Super League. Okay. And then in cup competitions, eight appearances, seven starts, seven goals. So it's basically when he kind of has the backing, when he has people believing in him, and when he's getting the start, he creates opportunities. So I think for those reasons... Either he comes in as a sub and maybe does something good, and so he gets to start the next game. But if Albania scores, Sokol Sikaleshi will be involved. That was a lot of stats. Mm-hmm. I'm going with something more emotional. What you got? No one at Euro 2016 mm-hmm. will sing their national anthem louder, <laughs> prouder, or harder than Lorik Chana. See, again, what are the measurable... <laughs> how do we measure these predictions? Volume. <laughs> okay. So I expect you to have some sort of... Like ammeter in front of it, and you can. Uh, We're you in can a studio. Check it out. We can we just go. record every national anthem, <laughs> okay. and then we measure them afterwards, and then I'll like increase the gain on uh, <laughs> like China, and I'll win the point. That's fine. He may have it for this competition, but no one will ever sing their national anthem louder than Reno Gattuso sings the Italian <laughs> right. national anthem. Well, that's kind of interesting. Like China is a Reno Gattuso kind of player, yep. right? He was a midfield terrier bulldog, any kind of mm-hmm. uh, aggressive animal that you want to add in there. He now he's thirty two now. He plays centre back for Albania. Still aggressive, but he's also like the leader of this Albanian back four. Um, he's the captain. He's the guy that has been around the longest, mm-hmm. if you know what I mean. Like, he's a guy that uh, predates uh, Dibiase's, like tenure as Albania coach. So he, go- he goes all the way back. Why did you do that? So- <laughs> all I hear is Ted Dibiase now. <laughs> he's the guy. Larry Chan is the guy that goes all the way back to when Albania were terrible, uh-huh. essentially. And now, when, they- when he was a young man, they were terrible. Now he's captain. Now he's leading them out mm-hmm. at a tournament. And then I also saw this Serbia game we talked about with the drone and the terrible incident. When they did the national anthems, the Albanian national anthem was booed louder than I've ever heard anything booed. As the camera panned across, across the players, mm-hmm. the Albanian players, many of them looked kind of um, scared mm-hmm. and quiet in their singing. Lorik Chana going for it. Even, even when surrounded by booing Serbians, he went for it. So Lorik Chana, I think, will sing loud and proud and will play just as aggressively. I like it. Uh, well... I already had one goalkeeper on the move this summer in the form of uh, Fernando Muslera. I yeah. made that prediction with Uruguay in the Copa America. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say that 28-year-old goalkeeper Etrit Berisha will be on the move this summer as well. Yeah, he looks he looked good. I saw some highlights of him. I was really impressed. So he started every single game of Euro qualifying, but only nine Serie A games for Lazio this season. And the key thing with those Euro qualifiers, if you go back, he had basically amazing performances. And you can see the highlights when uh, Albania kicked off this, their qualifying run by beating Portugal away 1-0. And it's really because of the saves of young Mr. I guess 28 for a goalkeeper is young, right? Yeah. Uh, Berisha. And then the 0-0 draw against Denmark, same thing. Like He basically got them those four points with how good of a performance it was. But I guess I think basically because he isn't getting any time at Lazio, there are already some rumors that he might be on the move, and I think one big game or one and a half big games in this group stage could be enough to get him a move to a bigger and better club. Yeah, that makes sense. Or at least a starting gig at a club. Yeah, starting. Yeah, he'll mm-hmm. get himself a starting gig. Right. Yeah. I had in my notes, this is a possible prediction mm-hmm. I was going to have, is that he would lead the tournament in punches. Because <laughs> he loves to punch across. I think Albania will be peppered with all kinds of crosses from uh, many teams. So, okay, I'm going to amend that to Etrit Berisha will get himself a starting gig come the 2016 season. Fair enough. <laughs> it's, but it's worth keeping an eye on him because yeah. he'll be important to Albania's chances. Absolutely. My next prediction is about the right back, um, El Cid Hissage, um, who I had not heard of, um, and I'm almost ashamed to say it, before doing this preview. Really impressive guy. He plays right back uh, for Napoli. Um, mm-hmm. I watched lots of highlights of him, and I was so impressed. So this is a kind of tall right back. So mm-hmm. He's like a, a graceful centre-back playing right back. 
right? So he makes all kinds of tackles, lots of sort of really quick thinking interceptions where he gets ahead of someone and then charges forward. Um, loves to head the ball back to his keeper under pressure. Makes him look really calm and smooth. I think El Cid Hissage makes the team of the tournament. Ooh. Yes. That's interesting. But would that require them to go past the group stages? Maybe. Or it may just require three magnificent performances in the group stage. Hmm. Right? So, And then, well, I guess that's my question, though. So if they lose three games or they lose two and draw one like even if he has outstanding performances do you think that those will be remembered even though they lost two games they'll be remembered by me <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're Wait, are, we, right. are we saying your team of the tournament no we're saying the okay, team of the tournament cool. that's my prediction he makes the team He's of trying the to tournament. Narrow, nail these things down <laughs> He also offers kind of a threat going forward. He has a great mm. eye for a pass. So he could be the guy that launches an Albanian counterattack with a sort of long floated ball out of the back for Albania. So right. El Cid Hissaj is the man to watch playing right back for Albania. Excellent. Any more for Albania? Or shall we move on to the Swiss? Um, I've got a couple of, uh, a couple of mentions. What's um, he got? Shelzen Gashi mm-hmm. of Colorado Rapids. Yeah. I predict he'll maybe have the best performance of any MLS player. Or okay. he'll maybe have the most minutes of any MLS <laughs> player. Okay. Right? Because Robbie Keane's kind of injured. Yeah. Kevin Doyle doesn't always start for Ireland. Mm-hmm. Um, Lawrence Simon, mm-hmm. um, I'm not sure he starts for Belgium. He's not going to get that many minutes. Humdi, so Hamdi Salihi doesn't play in MLS and is sitting at home. Yeah, he was not selected <laughs> he's, by he's Albania. He's excluded doubly. Yeah. yeah. Um, Gashi, current Colorado Rapids player. Mm-hmm. I think he'll have the most minutes of any, um, any MLS player um, at Euro 2016. All right. Um, one guy to keep an eye on, maybe, uh, Milat Rashika of mm-hmm. Vitesse. Yep. He's a 19-year-old right winger. I think Jonathan Wilson sort of spotlighted him as a really dribbly, exciting player. Only has two caps, so he may not play very much. But if you see Milat Rashika coming on, that could be a sign of exciting things. If I see him linking up with my man, El Cid Hissage down the right wing, mm-hmm. that'll be something to keep an eye on. <laughs> with your man. And then there's a very important man in midfield, uh, Tulat Shaka. Mm-hmm. But I get the feeling we're going to get to talk about him when we talk about Switzerland. Yeah, I think yeah. briefly at least for me. I'm not sure about you. How about this? Tulat Shaka, uh-huh. the uh, Albanian midfielder, mm-hmm. will exchange jerseys with his brother, Granit Shaka. That's a safe when bet. The two, at the end of the game when the two play each other. That, that was definitely a game going into my research that I was like, ah, oh, Albania, Switzerland, whatever. And now it's one of the games I want to see the yeah. most because you have so many players in Switzerland with that play for Switzerland that have connections to Albania yeah. and vice versa, essentially, because it might even just be like family friends who now live in Switzerland. It's just there's that kind of community aspect of these two games, yeah. or these two teams that I think will make that game especially interesting. And if we want to talk about the Shakas for a minute, mm-hmm. I guess this is the time to talk about it. Um, it all goes back to Kosovo, mm-hmm. right? There was the ethnic cleansing in Kosovo. There was people were, you know, refugees, fleed, um, ended up all over the place. And then someone like uh, Granit Xhaka um, ended up in Switzerland, mm-hmm. chose to play for Switzerland. Um, Tolat Xhaka ended up in Switzerland. Albania called him afterwards. He got to play for Albania. So a lot, a lot of guys who had a lot of options, and it's all about who they chose. I forget how it works now that Kosovo has gotten UEFA recognition or FIFA recognition. If they can all have that one-time switch now that they exist? They can, or they could. I'm not sure mm-hmm. if the window is closed, but uh, FIFA or UEFA did a thing where like, all the other rules don't apply. Mm-hmm. This new nation has been established. This new soccer team has been established. And I think you still have the option to go and play for them. But I don't know if the window is closed yet. Yeah, nor do I. Maybe maybe they gave him this tournament, and they're like, all right, you can decide afterwards. I, <laughs> actually, I want to say that might be the case, because I think when Albania qualified, I remember hearing lots of different pundits talk about how this like might be the only tournament that they ever qualify for, because afterwards all of these, or at least in the near future, because all these players have that possibility, or a lot of these players have that possibility of playing for Kosovo. But even if the current players mm-hmm. can't switch, it's about future players as well. Because right. the point is, this happened, I was, it was like 90, mid-90s, mm-hmm. um, when the, the Kosovo thing happened. So mm-hmm. it's a lot of guys who were young kids right. back then mm-hmm. some maybe hadn't even been born like uh, Tolat Shaka who plays midfield for them really highly rated player um, he plays for FC Bale in Switzerland mm-hmm. he's only 21 so you think there's a whole generation of players coming through now who will have the choice of playing for Kosovo mm-hmm. there we are so that's why Albania may be short of talent in the future because those guys will choose Kosovo alright well speaking of uh, one Shaka Switzerland yeah. shall we? Let's talk about Switzerland. All right. So um, Switzerland, we said, opening against Albania. Their coach is Vladimir Petkovic, who is a Croat Bosnian. Um, this is the first tournament for Switzerland post Otmar Hitzfeld. Mm-hmm. So I just remember every tournament. Oh, Hitzfeld's the coach. Yep. All of a sudden, he's not, and I feel slightly weird about it's it. It's like Switzerland, Denmark, and Greece. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so um, in World Cup 2014, they lost to Argentina in the round of 16 after extra time. This is a very talented team. And I think Petkovic is a bit more attacking mm-hmm. than Hitzfeld ever was. So you're going to see a kind of more adventurous 4-2-3-1 or 4-3-3 with, this is the one thing to point out with this team, very attacking fullbacks. You have Ricardo Rodriguez of Wolfsburg mm-hmm. on the left and you have Stefan Lechsteiner of Juventus on the right. Both of them love to get Forward. I think Luke um, will be captaining, but yeah, both of them we remember from that 2014 World Cup yeah. being provided. I mean, I think I won a couple of prediction points just by saying, like, Rodriguez will get across, Luke Steiner will have three like, chances created or crosses attempted, right. and they kept doing it. So keep your eyes on those fullbacks, um, getting forward, getting forward. Absolutely. Keep your eyes also on their current run of form. Because although they qualified well, uh, had a plus 16 goal difference, they have only won one of their last five games. So that Uh could be experimentation, trying to work out the roster. It could be maybe things not quite the way you want them to be going into a major tournament. But we shall soon find out. Do you have a specific prediction to kick us off? I do. It's that Gokhan Inler will not be missed. (laughs) So Inler is the Leicester City player. Yes who you may remember for 2014 World Cup, mm-hmm. did not make the roster? Did not make the roster. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I have it that at least 50% of previews published will discuss the absence of Gokhan Inler and how <laughs> it's going to be you know, a big hole to fill. And uh, similar to what we were talking about, and I think maybe that's why I was hesitant to say, like, like yeah, it's weird that they, they didn't include that guy or why this guy got left out. It's because it's moments like this where Gokhan Inler is that name that people know and, you know, oh, he just, you know, played for Leicester. They just won the Premier League. Of course you start him. But in reality, he hasn't been playing for Leicester, and yeah. he hasn't really been playing for Switzerland. And he was doing that kind of deep-lying, holding, shooting the back four role, and he's basically been moved out of that role. But I think we talked about it before. It's like the name people know tends to be the one they write yeah. about. So a lot of the narrative I saw was, Gokhan Inler's presence will be missed, and how will they adjust without this defensive anchor? And they've kind of already adjusted. So that's how they'll adjust. That leads me to my prediction. Mm-hmm. The man who I think will play that defensive shield role is Granit Xhaka, mm-hmm. recently signed for Arsenal. I think Granit Xhaka will get Arsenal fans very excited in this tournament. Yeah, I agree with that. But why do you say that? Because Arsenal fans... Or at least the smart Arsenal fans know that the type of player they're missing is a kind of more aggressive midfielder who will break up play and mm-hmm. launch counterattacks. That exa- is exactly what Shaka does. He does it for Bruce Munch and Gladbach. He does it for Switzerland. Mm-hmm. He he puts in a tackle, an interception, takes the ball off someone else, st- restarts the play, drives them forward. He even plays a little more attacking sometimes for Switzerland. So that Arsenal fans will see him as this nominally defensive guy who is actually heavily involved in the attack. So for that reason, Granit Xhaka is going to have Arsenal fans very, very excited with his performances. All right. Well, even though they did play different positions, I'm going to say Granit Xhaka will get the headlines heading into this tournament. Because of the Arsenal signing. Because of the Arsenal signing and because of his brother playing for mm-hmm. Albania. Mm-hmm. So I think for those reasons, you're going to see a lot of like, Granit Xhaka and Switzerland go up against blank. Coming up next. Um, so I think he'll get the headlines, but I think Jerdan Shakiri will get the assists. I'm predicting that he will have two assists at least in the group stage. Of course he will. He's Jerdan Shakiri. <laughs> so he had five total uh, throughout qualifying, four goals. So obviously he's still creative and the creator. So that's not that big of a prediction. But it's more about that I think... You see what happens at Stoke when, basically, again, it's confidence. It's he went into a situation where he was kind of embraced and allowed to do what he wanted to do and played really well as a result. So he's had a good season. And I think going to this tournament, because of Granit Xhaka, because of... It's kind of you keep hearing that hype about Switzerland, I would say, but I don't hear a lot about Jerdan Shakiri. Not At least not in the way that we did going to like the 2014 World Cup, where he was this exciting player who was with Bayern Munich and was maybe moving, but we don't know much about him, but he's really exciting. Here, I think he doesn't have quite as much pressure because I think... The names are a little bit more spread out. And it's also, there's not as much mystery about it, right? right? We've mm-hmm. seen him playing for Stoke for a whole season. We know what he can do. And I think he's also, when you're young and at Bayern Munich, there's this thing where you might be the next best player in the world, mm-hmm. right? You might be the next guy who's in that Messi-Ronaldo conversation. Right. I think what we've seen from him at Stoke is he's not at that level. Mm-hmm. And he's 24 now, but he's still a magnificent player. Exactly. Right? Yeah, and but, he's, so, but he's not that breakthrough. Like he's not going to be on the cover of Sports Illustrated, no. right? But he is going to be banging in. And if he is, he's going to get Mike Francesca. Mike Francesca yeah. really mad, <laughs> not Francesca. <laughs> he's not Totti. But you but, know what I mean about yeah. the hype is that that's it comes from that. Yeah, and once we know that his ceiling is here. Mm-hmm then people are less excited, even though they should be. Because if you're a real soccer fan, you enjoy seeing what he does. Exactly. And, that's, and so that's, I guess, what I'm getting at, is that I think we will enjoy seeing what he does because I think it's going to be 
the same uh, Jadon Shakiri we saw in the Premier League this season. It's the same Jadon Shakiri we saw at the 2014 World Cup. So I'm saying that means same buck shape guy. At least two <laughs> assists in the group stage. He will also win the Golden Bucks for most square muscly player at Euro 2016. At, at Euro 2016, I think Leo Messi gives him a run for his money overall. But yeah. yes, in this tournament, yes. Um, I have a Shakiri related prediction actually. Um, I think people, at least opposition defenses, mm-hmm. will be so focused on Shakiri they'll sleep on Admir Megmedi. So usually um, they play a central striker. They play Shakiri on the right, I think, and Mamedi on the left. Yep. And Mamedi is just as dribbly, just as smart, just as capable of threading through a pass, but doesn't seem to really have the uh, the press or the headlines or the focus. Like no one really thinks about him. Yeah. I think he'll surprise people. I think he might even outperform Shakiri in terms of goals and assists. Yeah. So you're saying in the group stage at least? Yes. So you're saying he'll have more goals and assists? Totally yeah, more offensive Shikiri. production. So more goals and assists than Jaron Shakir in yep. the group stage. Oof. Interesting, interesting. Do you have any more predictions about Switzerland? Um, I've got a c- couple of quick ones. Um, I'm waiting to see. I'm waiting Ricardo to see. Rodriguez uh-huh. will have the best or the highest bad hair to good soccer ratio. <laughs> Not Wait. sure how we measure that, but he has a pulled back ponytail. What's wrong with the pulled back ponytail? It's a pulled back ponytail. But Ricardo Rodriguez will get forward and play some good Wait. soccer from left back. What do you call what Gareth Bale has? Like a man bun, I What's guess. What's the difference? Neither are good. Ooh. 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 I don't know how I feel about that. I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah, it's that. Rodriguez versus Bale for the, the highest... Look, uh, just because you're a square. Who the will, highest who ratio. Who his hair out, man. <laughs> Whatever. I'm just not a part of your system, Daryl. <laughs> Happy birthday to the ground. <laughs> My other bonus prediction is Brilliant Bolo, the 19-year-old in the Total Soccer Show Scouting Network, will replace... Harris Seferovic by the end of the tournament mm-hmm. as Switzerland's central striker. And when he does, we'll hear about it from TSS scout Kirsten Mladiana. I'm, I'm disappointed in you. So I'm going to make my, my third specific prediction be that one player for the Swiss team will have a tackle that will make Daryl Grove proudly say that player's name. It's Valen Barami. That only happens once in a lifetime. <laughs> no, it's going to happen again. <laughs> so I'm going to ride my luck. So I got a prediction point off of him for the Premier League <laughs> predictions. I'm going to say Valen Barami will have a defensive play that will make Daryl Grove say with happiness, Valen Barami. Do you, me- do you remember why I was so excited about him? It, was, it wasn't a defensive play. It was, it was the run out of the back. Got, he got fouled yeah. and went down and bounced back up and carried on running. Yeah. And exa- they scored. Oh, yeah. yeah. But I, I still think it's going to be defensive play. It's okay. going to make you pleased. And I think he's gotten rid of his frosted tips, which, if we're sticking with the hairstyle always conversation, good. is always a good idea. Yeah, Switzerland not leading the world in, uh, in fashion <laughs> this tournament. See, I think what, the thing with Rodriguez is that doesn't he have a uh, the sides shaved ponytail? Yeah, the, yeah t- the edges have been taken it's, off. It's a little bit of like a future Fifth Element style haircut. That's where I, I take issue. Not into it. <laughs> so that's Group A. Anything else to add with, with, uh, with Switzerland or Group A before we move on? I guess just thinking about Group A, I mean... I'd, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with the France-Switzerland being favourites, but I also think R- Romania and Albania, I'm not prepared to write either of them off. Mm-hmm. Either of them could take third place with enough points to get through to the round of 16. And I will say, from researching this group, it makes me really excited for the Euros because I know, like, on paper, this isn't that exciting of a group. It's like, oh, it's some guys who are going to play defensive and whatever. Maybe there'll be a breakout name. But once you start reading about these teams and do a little bit of research and get familiar with one or two of the names, yep. it makes it so much more exciting. And so I would recommend, you know, listen to the shows, obviously, because we appreciate <laughs> that. But, yeah, do some reading. Get to know a few of the players. And then once they're out there on the field, you kind of have something to root for because yeah. – you know that guy. You're like, oh, yeah, you kind of feel this connection with him, regardless of whether or not you have an actual connection with that player. Speaking of, mm-hmm. um, very soon we'll be doing our Euro 2016 Group B preview. Yes. In Group B, you have England, Russia, Slovakia, and Wales. Obviously, we'll be following England through this tournament, yes. sort of in the way we're following mm-hmm. the U.S. through the Copa America, with sort of bigger breakdowns of the England games. Before we do that Group B preview, though, the roster was named this morning. It sure was. And it was kind of a surprise, right? Roy Hodgson was asked to choose between Daniel Sturridge and Marcus Rashford, and he refused to choose. He took both. He handcuffed them. He did. So he's named Sturridge and Rashford to the roster, and he's essentially done away with his fourth Mm centre-back. So instead, he's just going to take Chris Smalling, Gary Cahill, who seem to be the starters, and then John Stones, and that's it for England Mm centre-backs. So, yeah, I think I saw it written, five strikers, three centre-backs, one winger. Should work. (laughs) So I'm curious, Mr. Grove. Obviously, we're going to do the in-depth preview uh, tomorrow, or uh, I guess later this week, not tomorrow, excuse me. So what are your initial thoughts 
regarding this roster? I think I think that's a mistake because mm-hmm. I don't think we need five forwards. I don't think we need Sturridge and Rashford. Well, you guys are playing that like what four one five? Was that not your formation <laughs> you were going to play? No. It was not. <laughs> I mean, we'll probably be playing technically a lone striker, right. right? Harry Kane is kind of the the main centre forward, and then everyone else is like either behind him or mm-hmm. to the side of him. So that's why I feel like we don't need as many forwards as are on this roster. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing that worries me is Eric Dyer is our only real defensive midfielder, mm-hmm. like in terms of a guy that does the tackling. Jack Wilshere plays deep. He's not really a defensive midfielder. He's more of a passing midfielder. But Eric Dyer, because we only have three centre backs, is now the cover for centre back. Mm-hmm. So if Two centre backs get injured. Dyer has to move back. There's no defensive midfielder at all. Well, Wayne right? Rooney's talked about dropping deeper. Maybe he's not centre back. I mean, he may end up playing sort of deep midfield, but he's still not defensive midfielder. Oh he's no, not. I want him at centre back. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> In there, contesting headers, being feisty. What can and then, go wrong? Actually, that's the other question for me with this England team. Maybe mm-hmm. we'll get into this tomorrow. Is who plays behind Harry Kane? Mm-hmm. Is it Deli Ali, and then you have the Kane Ali partnership, mm-hmm. or is it Wayne Rooney, and then Deli Ali has to come even deeper to play sort of central mm-hmm. midfield? And I think. When we look at like the the Daniel Sturridge selection, I think I understand another reason why maybe you're not so pumped about it. Because I know you like Daniel Sturridge. You have nothing yeah. against him. But it reminds me of Jurgen Klinsmann's decision to bring Josie Altidore when he had hamstring issues. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing, right? It's essentially Roy Hudson has brought Daniel Sturridge, and if he's healthy, then he can play. And if he's not, then he has Marcus, Re- Marcus Rashford as his backup. But he's yep. essentially bringing an injured player and hoping he can play. Yep. And then if not, he has his 18-year-old deputy. And then at the same time, you've got Jack Wilshere just mm-hmm. back from injury, Jordan Henderson just back from injury. So mm-hmm. there's already three kind of semi... No, I mean, they're not injured, but they're just back. So it's not... You can't be fully confident that all's good. So that's three players out of 23 already that are kind of in trouble. So if you were to switch it around and see it from Uncle Roy's perspective, why would you say he's done this? Why would you say he dropped Danny Drinkwater, Andres Townsend, and Fabian Delph? Uh, I mean, Delph was kind of similarly mm-hmm. half injured. Um, Danny Drinkwater has never had an England game that has replicated his Leicester form. Mm-hmm. Um, Andros Townsend, you could argue that there are just other wingers like in the squad who could do the job. Like Raheem Sterling can just play wide mm-hmm. instead of Andros Townsend, and you don't nec- he hasn't earned his way. So there's other winger. In there. huh? <laughs> there's other winger. Yeah, well, it's sort <laughs> yeah. of Adam Lallana could play there, yeah. where you can ask someone else to play yeah. wide. Mm-hmm. Um, like Jamie Vardy could end up playing wide as well because there are there are so many strikers. Um, I, but I honestly think just Rashford's performance against Australia. Australia with the goal and then the sort of you showed me the fake for mm-hmm. the Rooney goal where he lets that ball run across him. Yeah. I think Rashford did did too much to the point where Hodgson couldn't exclude him without getting bad press. I see. You know what I'm saying? Maybe. I mean, I think I think the press wouldn't have minded. I would say it's kind of the opposite maybe that he wanted to bring him and really really wanted him to do something against Australia so then it would be justified because I do think he was going to bring Sturridge why not just take him instead of Sturridge because I think he no I think he wanted to bring him in case Sturridge can't play he wanted to have that other option if Sturridge is injured but if if Rashford went on there and looked completely out of his depth then it's sort of like oh boy now I'm bringing Sturridge and no other striker and I think that made him a little bit nervous so I think he was really really happy when Rashford scored that goal and got What do you mean assist. by no other striker? Because there's Harry Kane, there's Jamie Vardy, there's Wayne Rooney. Oh, I'm saying just as his like fourth-choice striker, which is what Daniel Sturridge, I think, will be I in see. this tournament. Um, and so that's my other question I wanted to ask you about the, those five strikers. Because as you said, England might play just that one lone striker. I've seen some people say that they might even play like a narrow diamond and try to clog the midfield. I think m- far more likely is it'll be a 4-2-3-1. Mm-hmm. So do you think any of those five forwards are going to be your wingers that... Maybe Jamie Vardy, okay. maybe um, Kane starting, mm-hmm. maybe Rooney behind him, Vardy to the left and Sterling to the right, mm-hmm. or vice versa. Yeah. yeah, I think you may end up like that. Okay, so then with this squad now selected, you've got your official 23. Are you as excited as you were heading into this tournament, or do you feel a little bit of trepidation now that these uh, kind of cuts have been made, the roster's finalized? I guess seeing the sort of imbalance makes mm-hmm. me a little wary, right? It's kind mm-hmm. of top-heavy with five strikers, mm-hmm. Three centre backs. It's like a like a man with a giant head <laughs> who may fall over. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. So that gives me pause a little bit, but I'm still basically excited. In the, but in the same way that I was for World Cup 2014, it's a lot, World Cup 2014 was a lot of young players like Sterling um, that I was excited to see in action because it was a more forward thinking mm-hmm. uh, England team. Those guys are a couple of years older now. Wayne Rooney is not in the terrible form that people were scared he might be going into this tournament. So, yeah, I'm so excited to see this England team play. I'll be looking forward to the first game to see them perform. And then how excited are you to see Wayne Rooney as a centre-back? 
I mean, it could come to that. <laughs> it could come to that. <laughs> Let's hope not. Let's hope not. But I guess we could find out with our specific predictions for Group B. Oh, I'll have plenty more to say when we do that. Um, but first, we'll be doing a USA versus Colombia preview, right? We've got to get, get down into the details of USA versus Colombia ready for the big game on Friday. This is the plan. So that show should be out uh, tomorrow afternoon, evening. Yeah. And then we'll have our Group B uh, of the Euro preview out later this week. So there you go. Mm-hmm. Lots of Total Soccer shows coming your way. And yes. it'll keep being that way for the next six weeks. Yes, sir. All right, Taylor Rockwell, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Dale Grove, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Listeners, thank you for listening. We'll hope you'll stick with us for the rest of our Euro preview.